hello and welcome to this video in this video i just want to recap the main points that we have just discussed in an online lecture with a number of form two students where we tackled the topic sound so i believe maybe you're coming in as having been a student in that online lecture that i delivered a few hours ago but even if you're not feel welcome because what we are talking about is the topic uh, sound which is chapter 9 of our course book in form 2 and we looked at the first three subtopics the need to study sound sources of sound and propagation of sound the other subtopics which include transmission of sounds in uh, solids liquids and gases including properties of sound waves and then the applications of reflection of sound will be covered in tomorrow's online lecture at this point i'd like to point out that when it comes to certain properties of sound which include refraction diffraction and interference and even reflection they are covered at greater length in another topic waves part two which is covered in uh, form three so when it comes to properties of sound we'll just uh, deal with a reflection and the problems at the end of the lecture the problem solving will involve reflection of sound welcome so let me go st straight to the need to study sound why should we study sound right now we are communicating via sound on your end you may be listening to me from the loudspeaker of your device this loudspeaker may be the loudspeaker from your microphone or from your laptop from your computer the external speakers which you have um, from your desktop computer or the microphone in your mobile phone now what is happening here is that the sound waves from your device from the diaphragm of the loudspeaker of your device is going to travel through air because the diaphragm of your device vibrates and then those vibrations are propagated through air they enter your ear they will strike the eardrum and the, your eardrum is going to vibrate now your eardrum is connected to your brain using nerve cells now these nerve cells are going to transmit these vibrations to your brain and then your brain will make use of the information that it has stored about vibrations to make sense of those vibrations right now there are so many sounds which are reaching you let's assume maybe there are birds outside there could be a dog which is barking outside but you can your brain cannot be able to interpret those barking to make any meaning out of those vibrations which are reaching your ear when a dog barks because it doesn't have stored information as to what those vibrations stand for so this is what i'm talking about you're able to understand what i'm saying because the vibrations which are coming from the loudspeaker of your device you're using your mobile phone the loudspeaker is over here it vibrates passes those vibrations through the air the same vibrations strike my eardrum those vibrations are transmitted to the brain then the brain makes use of stored information about similar vibrations to make sense of what i'm talking about and this is why we must study sound because we want to understand these vibrations and probably even be able to make use of the same let's talk about doctors doctors make use of ultrasounds to diagnose our bodies there are two major ways in which actually three ways in which uh, doctors can diagnose a patient to diagnose means to try to find out what is ailing the patient they can ask you how you are feeling that is the first method and then you tell them but sometimes when you they might want to carry out some tests 
in order to find out what you are ailing from. So they might want to look inside your body, the organ, to try and see what is happening there. They can use x-rays, they can use magnetic resonance imaging, they can use ultrasound to try and diagnose that problem. Earlier on in the olden days, they used to carry out surgery, actually open your body so that they can be able to see the inside. That is called open surgery, but we know the risks involved in open surgery. Now they can use a remote methods, which is much, much safer. In fact, ultrasounds and magnetic resonance imaging techniques are very, very safe, as opposed to x-rays. So ultrasounds, what are ultrasounds? Ultrasounds are sounds with a frequency which is much, much higher than the audible frequency. The frequencies which we can be able to hear range from 20 hertz all the way to 20,000 hertz. I'm talking about frequency with the confidence because I know in our previous topic where we talked about waves, we talked about frequency. And you know frequency is the number of vibrations and the number of oscillations made per unit time. And its SI unit is per second or hertz. So the audible frequency, the lowest we can hear is 20 hertz, the highest we can hear is 20,000 hertz. Beyond this, higher than 20,000 hertz, we cannot be able to hear. Lower than 20 hertz, again, we can't be able to hear. But there are some animals which can be able to detect higher than 20,000 hertz. They can be able to detect ultrasounds, in fact, make use of them. And one of such animals is the bat. It navigates its way around by producing ultrasounds. It sends them in various directions. And then when those waves go and hit an object, they are reflected. You know, reflection. One property of sounds that we are going to study, they are reflected. When the bat uh, detects those reflected sound, it's able to calculate the distance between itself and the object. It can even be able to detect whether this object is something that it can be able to eat, whether it is an insect, and so it pursues the insect. It's more like the radar that is used by the, the, the speed gun that is used by the police. What the speed gun does, it produces microwaves. Those microwaves, they will go and hit the bodywork of the car. They are reflected. And then the speed gun calculates the speed at which that vehicle is moving in order for the policeman to determine whether the driver is over speeding or not. And you can see the BAT makes use of this technique. We can also be able to use the same technique to help some of our brothers and sisters who are not able to hear or even to see to try and navigate their way around by using ultrasounds. But that one is subject for another day. I just want to point out that ultrasounds are used extensively by uh, medical practitioners to try and diagnose the patient. And we can be able to talk more on the need to study sound. Let's take your home, for example. Right now, you are in your living room. There are curtains. One of the functions of those curtains is that when you open the curtains, they allow light to come into your room. That's something good. Another function your curtains serve is to absorb unwanted sound, and they make your living room to be quiet, to be very peaceful, because you have cut out unwanted sounds. You may have gone into an, an open room, a hallway, for example, and you speak and you find that due to the reflections of sound, it's not easy to communicate very well. Why? We don't have objects which absorb reflected sound or they absorb sound. So we'll be talking about this when you're talking about a reflection. And here I have got these um, 
egg tray if it is made out of soft material such as carton that is uh, paper you'll find that you can even use the same as sound absorbers for your room let's say maybe you want to to design a small recording room for example you may be an upcoming musician and you are practicing so you want to design a small recording room at home you might want to to put some of the sound absorbers on the wall so that the sound which is reflected from the wall is not picked up by this microphone and it distorts the sound so in recording studios you might want to absorb those sounds that way and all this is the business of uh, uh, professionals or um, a course of study that you can be able to undertake as a sound engineer where you just study sound and then because you'll be working in environments such as recording studios uh, tv stations telecommunication equipment and so forth this will be your work as a sound engineer and those are some of the things which you need to put into consideration when you want to ask ourselves why should i study sound it's actually about life physics is about life the things we study in physics they are about our everyday life and one of these is the waves which we are using so we'll be talking a lot about this idea of physics being the study of actually life and as time goes by you will see a connection between that which we study and how we make use of the same in our everyday life situation so let's go to our second objective or subtopic which is sources of sound we we'll want to look at sources of sound and one important statement which i'd like you to put down is this sound is produced when objects vibrate how do they vibrate get a meter rule or a half meter rule clamp it on the bench using a jig clamp for example then pluck one end you'll actually be able to see the meter rule vibrate vibrate those are vibrations those vibrations may be transmitted directly to your ear because this meter rule is going to hit air molecules just next to to it and those vibrations are going to enter your ear the same way the vibrations of the loudspeaker entered your ear Another vibrating object could be a string, the wire of a guitar. Another one could be a vibrating drum. In music festivals, you usually make use of the drum. Smaller ones produce high pitch uh, frequencies, while the big ones produce low, uh, a low frequency or low pitch. And for those of us who have participated in music festivals, you are aware of using drums to produce sounds of different frequencies it is the skin of the drum which vibrates so again we are talking about sources of sound one the other source could be the drum what vibrates there is the skin of the drum another source could be you can be able to get a test tube fill it with some water and then blow across the test tube of course don't drink any liquid using the test tube in the lab we know that one very very well you just need to blow blow across and if you want to produce different frequencies get uh, several test tubes with with the different amounts of water inside there and when you blow you're going to produce sounds of different frequencies and again we are going to study that when we look at stationary waves in sound two or waves two the next one is you can make a cog wheel you can make a cog wheel like the one i've shown there just using cardboard and then you fix that cardboard onto a spindle connect that spindle to a motor to a drill bit and then rotate the same then hold another stiff card next to those uh, teeth you're going to produce sound of different frequencies depending on which layer of teeth you're going to use all these are sources of sound so very important sound is produced when bodies or when objects vibrate 
And while we are at this, I'd like to show you a simulation of this kind of situation where we have a loudspeaker whose diaphragm is vibrating. And maybe together with that, as I show you this, we are going to study how sound moves through certain media, especially through air. And we are going to study more on the idea of compressions and rarefactions. So let us head over to our simulation where we are going to study these compressions and rarefactions a little bit more. And here we are. In this simulation, I've got a loudspeaker and what surrounds the uh, loudspeaker, we've got air and on this other end, we can assume that you've got a human ear because we usually detect sound when the, vi the diaphragm vibrates. And let me set it into vibrations. That is what happens. And you can see there is something which travels from the speaker all the way to your ear. Again, that one is a pulse. And I can produce several pulses now. And it continuously vibrates like so. What are these... Let me just pause it. What are these bright rings and dark rings? We know that what makes up air, let me look at a situation whereby now I want to put particles there. Air is made up of particles which are in continuous random motion. They are not regularly arranged as can be seen over there they are arranged that way for a specific purpose for this particular simulation over here. So air is made up of particles which are in continuous random motion. That is kinetic theory, which you studied somewhere in form one, particulate nature of matter. And it is the medium through which sound travels. The material through which a wave travels is referred to as the medium of travel of the wave and it is at this point that we want to set the diaphragm into vibration notice what happens let me just freeze it there if you look at it especially if you look at it now from far you'll be able to see rings there's a ring here there's another ring here another ring here and another ring here separated by regions where the particles are are far away from each other. These rings, the particles are closer to each other, but in between the rings where the particles are closer to each other, there is another ring where the particles are far away from each other. The regions where the particles are closer to each other are actually high pressure regions. We're talking about air pressure. We can talk about air being at a pressure higher than atmospheric pressure or pressure which is lower than atmospheric pressure. So in this particular situation where we just have particles like that, they are at normal atmospheric pressure. But the moment we start sending the waves through, we make some regions to have a pressure which is higher than that of the atmosphere and some regions to have pressure which is lower than that of the atmosphere. The regions where the pressure is higher than that of the atmosphere, let me just freeze the wave, this is a region where the pressure is higher than that of the atmosphere and it's called a compression. A compression is that region where the air pressure is higher than that of the atmosphere while a rarefaction rarefaction is a region where the air pressure is lower than that of the atmosphere in other words you can say a compression is a high pressure region a rarefaction is a low pressure region and at this point i'd like you to observe this i'm not talking about air molecules being compressed you cannot compress an air molecule that is impossible. It cannot be compressed. But you can make air molecules with their sizes to either move closer to each other 
but they still maintain their sizes or far away from each other. And again, they still maintain their sizes. That is different from talking about compressing an air molecule. So don't make that mistake when you are giving an explanation here. Remember, it is the air molecules which will come closer, referring to that as a high pressure region or a compression, or they are further away than normal, referring to that as a rare faction. So the rings you are seeing where the molecules are closer together represent a compression, where they are far away from each other represents a rare faction. So we are going to say that sound is propagated by a series of compressions and rare factions. It's at this point now that I want to illustrate this on my whiteboard so that you can see how we draw them. So let's head over to my whiteboard and draw the same. So here we are at my whiteboard. I'm going to draw some lines on this paper to represent, just to mark the edge where I'm going to draw the compressions and the rear functions. I'm going to draw another one here. And there we have it. So we are going to use lines to represent a compression. That could be a molecule, another one, and you can see they are very close to each other. That is a compression represented by C. And then after that, we are going to have a region where the air is at normal atmospheric pressure, like that. And you can see the particles are a little bit now further away from each other. After that, we are going to have a rare function where the particles are far away from each other, followed by a region where the particles are at normal atmospheric pressure, and then followed by a region where the particles again are very close, another compression. So there's a compression here. From here to here is a compression. And then from somewhere here, all the way to somewhere here, it's a rare function. At the boundary is where the air is at normal atmospheric pressure. The compression will represent a wave crest. This other compression is also a wave crest. The rare function is a wave trough. And when we join the crest and the trough, we get a wave which looks like that. And we have seen that shape before, the shape of a wave. And uh, we said the distance from one crest to the next is actually representing a wavelength. I can draw this equilibrium position here. And on the y-axis, I'm going to have a pressure. Pressure. At the equilibrium position is where we have normal atmospheric pressure. The crest is at a pressure higher than atmosphere, like you can see on the graph. The rare function is at a pressure lower than an atmosphere. And you can also see it here. So when you draw a pressure distance graph, this is the kind of graph that you're going to have. Remember, a compression is a high pressure region where the air pressure is higher than that of the atmosphere. A rare function is a low pressure region where the pressure is lower than that of the atmosphere. In between, at this point, we've got air at normal atmospheric pressure. Normal atmospheric pressure. And even this other point here, normal atmospheric pressure. But sometimes we draw the compressions connected to the rare functions and we lose the fact that in between the two boundaries, there is a particular point, a particular region where 
the particles will be at normal atmospheric pressure. Before we can get to a rarefaction, they must start moving away, further away. And before we can get to a compression, they must start coming closer together. And that is how you would represent the compressions and the rarefactions on paper. Okay, they are the regions where the particles will be very close to each other here, regions where the particles are far away from each other compared to normal atmospheric pressure. And that is what we have seen in our simulation over there. So remember this. Waves, because we are on the third subtopic here, we are asking ourselves, how are these waves propagated through certain media? Because sound can travel through air, solids, and liquids. These media are made up of particles, and these particles are in perpetual motion. Perpetual motion. When something comes and hits the, these air molecules, like for example, the diaphragm of a loudspeaker, you have got a simple loudspeaker. When this diaphragm has some current passing in it and it starts vibrating, it will move in this direction. It will strike a mass of air molecules here, forcing them to come closer together, creating a compression. And then it will retract back. When it pulls back, it creates a region of low pressure called a rarefaction. So it continuously creates compressions, rarefactions, compressions, rarefactions, compressions, rarefactions. And these molecules, they pick up these vibrations. And when the molecules move this way, they move closer together, uh, producing a compression. When they move back, they produce a rarefaction. And again, when they move forward, they, uh, they produce a compression. And I want to point out here that it is the compressions and the rarefactions which move through the medium. It is not the particles which move across. Let me go back to the simulation so that I can emphasize that point. Over here, let's look at these particles, the red particles, for example. You see this red particle here? Uh, I'm not able to come. Yes, this red particle here, it just keeps on moving to and fro to and fro and so is every other particle pick a particle and follow its motion you'll see that the particles don't start from here and then they move all the way to the end that does not happen they just pass these compressions and rarefactions it's it's like they are collecting energy from here passing it it onto its neighbor collect some more pass it over and their neighbors pick that energy, they pass it over to their other neighbors. And this is how waves are transmitted through various media. It is then not the original particles which move from the diaphragm all the way to you, to the diaphragm of your eardrum. No. Those particles are very close to the diaphragm. They keep on moving to and fro, to and fro here. Their neighbors, they pick those vibrations. Those neighbors pick those vibrations. Those neighbors pick those vibrations until the vibrations reach the molecules which are just next, next to your eardrum. Those are the ones which start vibrating and they hit your eardrum. And your eardrum uh, detects the vibrations, makes sense of it using your brain, and you can say communication has taken place. So the molecules just need to move to and fro, to and from. And that brings us to the end of today's online lecture. So you, if you're in that online lecture, remember this one is just a review of that uh, lecture and it's going to be of much, much more help. Remember tomorrow we have another lecture in which case now we are going to talk about transmission of these waves through various media. And we'll be talking about the speed of the waves. We'll also talk about reflection of sound. And most importantly, we'll look at the calculations at the end where we use the properties of sound to reflect these waves. So if you have not subscribed to my channel yet, go right ahead, subscribe. Because of here, we have, uh, I have very 
uh, good uh, videos on nearly all the topics. If there is a topic that is giving you a problem, try to search through my videos over here and you'll be able to see that uh, you can get some help in one way or another. And if you are not in our online class, please come in into our online classes and that is where you're going to get a lot of learning taking place. So until tomorrow, when I meet you in class, it's bye-bye.